Hello. In the previous lecture, we discussed what is a normal field extension. Let me quickly recall the theorem that we proved. So assume that E is a field extension of F and the degree of this field extension is finite. We sometimes just simplify it and say E is a finite field extension of F. It does not mean that E is a finite field. It means that the extension is finite. Okay, so assume that E is a finite field extension of F, then the following statements are equivalent. The first one is that E is a splitting field of some polynomial. The second one is that if I pick any extension of E, then every automorphism, every F automorphism of this field extension sent E to itself. The last one says that for every element of E, the minimal polynomial of this element over F can be decomposed completely into linear factors in E bracket X. Alternatively, I can say all the zeros of the minimal polynomial of beta are already inside E. So the, the last property when we have the last property, we say the field extension of E over F, the field extension E of F is a normal field extension. And so this um, theorem says that an, a finite normal extension, uh, a normal field, a, a field extension, a finite field extension is normal if and only if it's a splitting field of some polynomial. And this happens precisely when every automorphism of a field extension of E sends E to itself. An immediate corollary of this result is the following that if I give you a normal field extension of F for every other field extension of for every field extension of E, if I start with the group of automorphisms of L and restrict them to E, because of the second property, we know that such an automorphism, when I restrict it to E, the image will be again E. This means that the restriction of theta to E would be an isomorphism from E to E that be called an automorphism. And because we have started with an F linear automorphism, the image will be also an F linear automorphism from E to E. That means what? That means the restriction map, restriction of an automorphism from L to L, when I restrict it to E, ends up being an automorphism of E that is F linear. And restriction is rather easy to see that it's a group homomorphism. So altogether, we get a well-defined group homomorphism from the F linear automorphisms of L to F linear automorphisms of E. Moreover, when I look at the kernel of this uh, group homomorphism, what does the kernel mean? It means that when I restrict theta to E, I'm supposed to get the identity map. That means when I, so if theta is in the kernel of this map, it's restriction to E's identity, which means it's an E linear map. And vice versa, if it is an E linear map, then the restriction of theta to E is the identity map. And therefore the kernel of this restriction map is nothing but E linear automorphisms of L. In particular, because it's kernel of this group homomorphism, we deduce that the E linear automorphisms of L is a normal subgroup of F linear automorphisms of L. You see now the connection between being normal as a field extension and having certain groups as a normal subgroup of the other one. So again, let's try to understand it. We have this picture L is a field extension of E. E is a normal field extension of F. Then when I look at the E linear 
automorphisms of L, that would become a normal subgroup of F linear automorphisms of L. So you have to be careful about uh, these uh, groups. They can become uh, quite subtle and the students often confuse them. So one thing that you have to have in mind that in this kind of process, the L automorphisms, we can only talk about uh, subgroups of L automorphisms if I'm still working with L automorphisms. So when I work with automorphisms of E, it is not a subgroup of uh, automorphisms of L. So do not get confused between uh, the image of this guy and these, uh, these L automorphisms. But when I make the field a bit larger, then E linear automorphisms are clearly F linear automorphisms because E contains F. So that's, that means clearly this is a subgroup of this one. And here, what we are saying is that when E is a normal extension, then this subgroup is going to be a normal subgroup. The converse is also true, but we will prove it later. So that's why, how you see the connection between a normal subgroup and a normal field extension. And here, what we are saying is that whenever I give you um, theta that goes from L to L, when I restrict it to E, I end up going to E again. And that's the content of the first part, which is essentially uh, the second property of being a normal uh, extension. And um, the second part of this corollary is that if I, if in addition I tell you, so so far we have we have been working under the assumption that L E is a normal extension of F. Now, if in addition I tell you that L is also a normal extension of F, then we can say that this group homomorphism is surjective. Okay, not, not, not only normal, but also I add finite because of the, because, because of the theorem that we proved. We had that these three parts are equivalent precisely when uh, the extension, no, not precisely when, when the extension is a finite uh, field extension. Um, in fact, the second part and the third part are equivalent, even if the extension is not finite, but we are not discussing it in this course. Okay, so uh, let's go through the proof of uh, this corollary. So by the way, uh, now that this is surjective, we can use the first isomorphism theorem uh, in group theory and deduce that the image of this restriction map, now we know it's supposed to be surjective, is isomorphic to its domain modeled by the kernel. We know that the kernel is cons consists of E linear automorphisms of L. The domain is the F linear automorphisms of L. And uh, when L is a normal extension of F, by the second part of this corollary, we are shown, we are claiming that uh, this restriction map would be a surjective map. Let's also try to understand uh, this claim in, in a diagram. Diagrams usually can help us to remember uh, to remember the statement in a better way. So what does what does surjectivity mean? We are given an F linear automorphism of E. That means that this diagram <clears throat> is commutative. And we want to say that this F linear automorphism of E is in the image of the restriction map. This means I can extend it to an automorphism from L to L. So there exists some theta that's uh, in that makes this diagram a commutative diagram. Okay, that's that's the claim. Let's uh, let's go through the proof. Again, as I've pointed out, because E is a finite normal extension of F by the theorem that we proved, uh, the second part of the theorem implies that for every automorphism, every F automorphism of L, uh, we have the theta of E is E. That means when I restrict theta to E, I am end up ending getting an automorphism of E, an F linear automorphism of E. Okay, so it's well-defined map. 
then now it's rather easy to, to check that it is indeed a group homomorphism. So we get a well-defined group homomorphism. Now let's see what is the kernel. Theta is in the kernel. We have already discussed this. So I'm going through this a bit quicker. This happens precisely when the restriction of theta to E is identity. And that's equivalent to saying that it is an E linear map. And therefore that belongs to E linear uh, automorphisms of L. Okay, so in particular, it's a normal subgroup as we claimed. Now let's, let's go to the second part. Because L is a finite normal extension of F, it is a splitting field of some polynomial. Now we can use, now that it's a splitting field of some polynomial, we can use the isomorphism extension theorem and extend theta to an, to an isomorphism uh, from E to itself. So we can extend every uh, isomorphism from E to E to an isomorphism from the splitting field to itself. And that's exactly what we wanted to show because that means that restriction of this automorphism to E is precisely theta bar, which implies surjectivity of the restriction map. Now that it is surjective by the first isomorphism theorem in groups, first isomorphism theorem for groups, uh, we get that uh, domain mapped out by the kernel is isomorphic to the image, but the image is surjective. I mean, uh, this map is surjective, therefore image is precisely the codomain and um, we get the claimed isomorphism. We'll come back to this uh, in, um, in 100C when we talk about uh, Galois extensions and Galois theorems. Okay, so now, now what? Um, we want to understand normal extensions a bit better. Uh, so, Whenever we, whenever we discuss a property of uh, field extension, we should ask ourselves, how does this property behave with respect to tower of field extensions? For instance, we have already discussed that if I give you a tower of fields like this, if I tell you that um, E over F is a finite field extension, and L over E is a finite field extension, then we can deduce that L over F is a finite field extension because of the tower rule and vice versa. If L over F is a finite field extension, then L over E and E over F, both of them are finite field extensions. Now, this is the type of question we should ask ourselves whenever we are told about certain property of a field extension. Now we want, we want to address this kind of question for normal extensions. So suppose that I give you a tower of fields, F contained inside E, E contained inside L as subfields. Then for every beta that I give you in the largest field L, the minimal polynomial of beta over E divides the minimal polynomial of beta over F, of course, in E bracket X. Otherwise, it doesn't quite make sense because this polynomial is not necessarily, does not necessarily have coefficients inside F. So it lives inside E bracket X. This one lives inside F bracket X, but F is a subfield of E. So it does make sense to talk about this divisibility in E bracket X. So this is true for every beta inside L. And then from here we can use, you are going to use the first part and deduce that if L over F is a field extension, is a normal field extension, then L over E is a normal field extension. So what we are saying here is that, okay, maybe uh, at the moment we do not know other parts of this tower kind of picture. But what we do know is that if I tell you I have this tower of fields. If I tell you that this guy over this guy is normal, L over F is normal, then we can deduce that this guy is normal. We are not claiming anything about E over F at this point. 
Okay, so uh, let's start with, uh, with the first part. It's rather easy, but it's important to observe this. Um, because beta is a zero of this minimal polynomial of beta over f by that definition. And uh, then it means we know that if beta is a zero of any polynomial, then the minimal polynomial over E should divide it in E bracket X. That means that the minimal polynomial of beta over E should divide the minimal polynomial of beta over F in E bracket X. So you have to be careful here. We have two minimal polynomials, but one of them is minimal among the polynomials with coefficients inside capital F. The other one is minimal among the polynomials with coefficients inside E. So we are given more flexibility, more choices when we extend the field. Therefore, the minimal polynomial with coefficients inside E can potentially be, can potentially have, I mean, can, can be of a smaller degree uh, compared to the minimal polynomial of beta with coefficients inside f. Okay, so now let's go to the second part. So assume that L is a normal extension of f. What does that mean? By the definition of normal extension, that means that for every element of L, the minimal polynomial of beta over f, this minimal polynomial can be written as a product of degree one polynomials in L bracket X. Alternatively, all the zeros of the minimal polynomial of beta over F are inside L. Okay, so this is the definition of being a normal extension. So the minimal polynomial of every element inside L has all the zeros inside L. Alternatively, it can be written as a product of degree one factors in L bracket X. But by the, by the first part, the minimal polynomial of beta over E divides the minimal polynomial of beta over F. So when this larger, I mean, in terms of divisibility, um, this multiple of the minimal polynomial of beta over E can be written as a product of degree one factors, so is the minimal polynomial of beta over E. So that means, again, this can be written as a product of degree one factors in L bracket X. That's a definition of being a normal extension. So that implies that L is a normal extension of E. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so, um, so far we have that if L over F is a normal extension, then L over E is a normal extension. But can I say the other parts of this tower uh, picture? So, so again, so far L over F implies that L over E is normal. But there are many examples that the other parts would, will fail. So let, let's see these examples. For instance, we know that this is a splitting field of x to power three minus two over q. Now, because it's a splitting field of some polynomial over q, we get that it is indeed a normal extension over q. But on the other hand, Q joined with the third root of two is not a normal extension over Q. Why is that the case? Because the minimal polynomial of the third root of two over Q using Eisenstein's criterion is precisely x to the power three minus two. And this polynomial has zeros that are not inside Q bracket the third root of two to be more precise. So this polynomial has only one real root and the other two roots are these complex roots
And these complex, complex roots are not inside this field extension. So that implies that the field extension Q bracket, the third root of two is not a normal extension of Q because I'm giving you an element whose minimal polynomial is not, cannot be decomposed into product of irreducible degree one factors in um, Q joint root three and the third root of two bracket X. So, I mean, either I can argue it like this, or I can say that um, this X to power three minus two is equal to X minus the third root of two. And the other degree two factor is irreducible. And therefore it's not product of degree one irreducible factors. So this would be this and Anyway, so because it does not have a zero here, it does not have a real zero, it does not have a real zero, therefore it does not have a zero inside Q bracket third root of two. Okay, so now we've seen an example where the larger field over the smallest field is a normal extension, but the, the little, I mean, in the initial part of the tower is not a normal extension. How about I tell you both of the steps are normal? Can I deduce that the, the whole uh, largest over the smallest is normal? The next example says, no, this is not the case. Why? The building block comes from this, that if I tell you a field extension is of degree two, then it is indeed a normal extension. Why is, the, why is this the case? Because for every alpha that I give you inside E, if it is already inside F, then the minimal polynomial is of degree one. There is nothing to prove. But if it's not inside F, then the minimal polynomial of F uh, alpha over F is of degree two. Because the degree of this field extension is two, it cannot be more than two. Then therefore it is of degree, it is, this has degree two. This means it is X minus alpha times X minus alpha prime for some alpha prime. And that shows that uh, uh, it is decomposed completely as a product of two factors, uh, uh, two factors of degree one. Okay, so therefore it's a normal extension. Again, the key result, the key point was that a minimal polynomial, a minimal polynomial of an element cannot have degree more than two when the degree of my field extension is two. It is again, you can use the tower result in order to show this the tower rule. So in particular, when I add the, the radical of two to Q, that extension is normal. When I add the fourth root of two to Q, then the degree of this field extension is again two. And therefore it's a normal extension. But the, the top one over the bottom one is not a normal extension with a similar argument as we had over here because um, the minimal polynomial of the fourth root of two is x to the power four minus two using Eisenstein's criterion. And uh, the other roots of this minimal polynomial do not belong uh, to, um, do not belong to, so it, this minimal polynomial does have a complex root, which means that that's not inside this, this field. So I leave it to you as an exercise to work out the details of this. But we, we are, what, we am, what I'm trying to emphasize is that this normal extension is quite subtle. And uh, when I give you a tower, um, you cannot, if I tell you the pieces are, are normal, you cannot necessarily deduce that the, the whole thing is normal. If I tell you the whole thing is normal, you cannot deduce that all the pieces are normal. The only thing that you can deduce is that the top part is normal. Okay, so you have to be caution, cautious when you are uh, uh, trying to use this normal extension to deduce normality of the smaller pieces. Okay, so now, in the previous lecture, when I wanted to prove uh, that uh, these three parts and these three properties of 
field extensions are equivalent. I briefly talked about normal closure of a field extension of finite degree. And I have pointed out that this, this construction uh, is quite common uh, because it's an important concept. I want to go over this part again and uh, formulate it as a separate statement. And uh, we might be, I mean, we will be using this in, uh, in 100 C when we talk more about Galois extensions. Okay, what is the statement? I give you a finite field extension, E over F. Then we can always find a normal extension of F that contains E. And we can find, we can talk about smallest such field, of course, up to an isomorphism. So let's again try to formulate this statement. We can always find a field extension of E, the largest guy, which is a normal extension of F. And moreover, whenever you give me such a field, L prime, let's say, satisfies these two conditions, I can choose L to be the smallest one, which means what? Which means I can find an E embedding of this L that I'm giving you into L prime. So any other field that satisfies these two conditions, meaning an extension of E and a normal extension of F has a copy of this L inside itself. This L is called the normal closure of the field extension E over F. And you can see why it is called normal closure. The concept, I mean, the, the word closure is often used in mathematics when we want to find the smallest object with that property. So when we say it's normal closure, this means we are finding the smallest object that is, uh, that's going to give us a normal extension of our field extension. Okay, so let's see why uh, we, we have this proposition. And it's um, the same method as uh, we've seen in the previous lecture, meaning we start with a basis of our field extension. We do know that it is uh, a finite field extension. So therefore we do have a finite basis for our, uh, our field extension. So let's say they are gamma one, dot, dot, gamma n. And then we let L be a splitting field of the product of these minimal polynomials. But because I want to make sure that E is a subfield of L, I'm going to take it to be a splitting field of this minimal polynomial over E. So automatically it's going to contain E. But because I want to argue that L is a normal extension over F and not over E, I have to argue that I can view it as a splitting field of some polynomial over F. Okay, I start with a splitting field of some, some polynomial over E, but then I argue that in fact it is a minimal polynomial of the, the same polynomial F over F. Notice that this polynomial small f, all the coefficients are inside capital F because I'm multiplying the minimal polynomials of, of gamma i's over F. And therefore these, they, these are all polynomials inside F bracket X. So this guy does belong to F bracket X. It is in the right field. It is in the, the coefficients belong to the right field. But here I'm working with, uh, I'm, I'm saying that consider the splitting field of this polynomial over E and that part is, is, uh, I have, is the thing that I have to work with and change to F. But what does that mean that it is a splitting field of this polynomial? This means I can find a bunch of elements inside this field L and I'm going to parameterize them in terms of these uh, minimal polynomials of gamma i comma f's. So meaning what? So for every i, I'm going to get gamma sub i comma one, gamma sub i comma two, gamma sub i comma m sub i. And these are supposed to be zeros of the minimal polynomial of gamma i over f. So that means I'm taking this product. Now notice 
that uh, because I'm talking about the minimal, um, I'm talking about the splitting field of this binomial over E, gamma I is already there. This means that I already have at least one of the zeros of this minimal binomial. I might need to add other zeros, but I have at least gamma sub i uh, inside this field extension, inside this uh, field, in the base field. So that means I can choose one of these zeros to be gamma sub i, and for simplicity, I choose that the first index to, to give me gamma sub i. So that's why I'm, I'm setting and I'm allowed to set that gamma sub i comma one is gamma sub i. Okay, so I can find these elements, these zeros inside this splitting field L. And moreover, as a field over E, if I add these zeros to E, I end up getting the entire L. That, that's the definition of being a splitting field. So whenever I tell you that L or K is a splitting field of a binomial over another field, it's a good idea to write down this statement. What does it mean that it's a splitting field? It means that uh, it has all the zero. I can write down this binomial as product of degree one factors, and this field is generated by the base field and these zeros. So write it down. It might or might not be useful in your proof or your home, in your uh, problem, but it's a good idea to have it there. And uh, often it, it it turns out to be useful. So knowing that L is a splitting field of this binomial, it means that I can find a bunch of zeros for this binomial, write it down as product of these degree one factors, and L is equal to the field generated by, to the ring generated by E and, and these zeros. Now, because E is the F span of gamma one to the, the gamma N, it is in particular equal to f gamma one dot dot gamma n. And because gamma i's are already over here, that means I can change this e to f. Because, I mean, if I change it to f, then e is already there. And therefore, the e, the, the field generated or the ring generated by f and gamma sub i j's. This guy already contains E, and then therefore by star, it does contain L. It is already inside L, it does contain L, so we get the equality that it is equal to L. And the polynomial F, which is inside F bracket X, is written as product of these degree one factors inside L. So this means I'm adding zeros of this polynomial with coefficients inside capital F, to the base field F, and I'm getting L. That's the definition of being a splitting field over F. So L is a splitting field over F. Hence, it's a normal extension. This, this was one of the, uh, so the, being a splitting field of a polynomial was part one of the theorem. Being a normal extension was part three. So th these are all equi equivalent. So we deduce that L over F is a normal extension. Okay, so uh, because, I mean, that's exactly what we wanted to, to get, yeah? So we found a field extension of E that's normal over F. Now let's see why it is the smallest such thing. Suppose L prime is a normal extension and it does contain E, then what? That, what does that mean? I again, I start with the basis that we have. For every element inside the basis, because E is a subset of L prime, L prime is supposed to be a field extension of E. Because E is a subset of L prime, I can find, I can split, notice L prime over F is normal, right? This means that every element of L prime, if I look at the minimal polynomial of that element, I can, I can write it as product of degree one factors. So I can find gamma prime sub ij's in L prime and write down this minimal polynomial as product of these degree one factors. 
okay, now if I look at the field generated by these zeros, the subfield generated by these zeros, notice that uh, because these guys are algebraic, I can look at the bracket and then that would be a subfield. So L double prime would be a subfield of L prime. What else do I know about L double prime? L double prime is generated by E and zeros of the polynomial. That's product of the minimal polynomial of gamma sub i's. That means it's a splitting field of this polynomial over E. Now I can use the uniqueness of a splitting field up to isomorphisms. Both L double prime and L are a splitting fields of the same polynomial over E. So by the, by the uniqueness of a splitting fields over E, we can find a unique, we can find an, isom an E isomorphism theta from L double prime and from L to L double prime. But remember L double prime is a subfield of L prime, is a subset of L prime. And therefore I am getting an embedding of L in 12 prime, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. So overall, we end up finding a normal extension of F, which contains E, and it's the smallest such, uh, uh, such field extensions. Meaning if, if I give you any other field extension with these properties, it's going to have a copy of this field extension of L over F. Okay, so now from this point on, we can and we'll talk about normal closure of a finite field extension. Now um, let's uh, let's see more properties of normal extensions. The next statement tells me that whenever I give you a, a tower of fields, then tell you that the larger one or the smallest one is a normal finite normal extension. then every embedding of the intermediate field to L, every F embedding of an intermediate field into L is going, I mean, every such F embedding can be lifted to an F automorphism from L to L. This proposition is going to give us a source of, uh, uh, getting lots of automorphism, L automorphisms, uh, F automorphisms from L to L. So again, let's, let's repeat the statement. So whenever I give you an F embedding of an intermediate, of an intermediate uh, field, so E is an intermediate uh, field between L and F. Whenever I give you an F embedding, that means that this diagram is commuting then I can extend it to an automorphism from L to L. So given theta, I can extend it and make sure that this diagram is still commuting, which means that the restriction of uh, theta half to E is going to be still theta. We have seen the statements like this. Um, we call this uh, isomorphism extension theorem, um, but it was, uh, I mean, this is more or less the same statement, but uh, now we are using the language of normal extensions. Okay, so suppose uh, I give you this uh, finite normal extension L over F by the definition, I mean, by the theorem that we proved, this is equivalent to saying that L is a splitting field of some polynomial over the base field capital F which means I can find a bunch of zeros inside this L of the polynomial F and decompose it completely into linear factors. Moreover, the field is generated by the base field F and the zeros half i's. So for sure, it is also generated by E because E is a subfield of L and these the same zeros. And of course, when I apply a theta, I end up getting that L is generated by theta of E, which is a subfield again, and theta of alpha i's. But notice that theta of alpha i's 
or what? Okay, you have alpha i's. Again, if if alpha i is zero of f and theta is an f isomorphism, then theta of alpha i's would be again zeros of f. So I'm just permuting alpha i's. This this argument we've seen before. So here I'm I wrote just alpha i's because theta of alpha i is just permute alpha i's. So let me write it over here. So theta of the set of alpha one dot dot alpha n is the same set. Because all of them uh, are zeros of f and theta just permutes zeros of f. Remember f belongs to uh, f bracket x and theta is an f linear map. So restriction of theta to capital F is identity. Therefore, theta of a small f is also f, which means the zeros of this binomial is just getting permuted by theta. So that means what? That means L is a splitting, can be viewed as a splitting field of F, the polynomial F or the base field E because of this equation. And at the same time, it can be viewed as a splitting field of theta of F over E of E, uh, theta of E because of this equation. So maybe I use red for this one and blue for this one. So because of these two, we get this. Now, now we can use the extension of isomorphism and the isomorphism extension theorem or extension of isomorphism. So the extension, the isomorphism, so the isomorphism extension theorem. And uh, from using the isomorphism extension theorem, we can find an isomorphism from L to L that extends the theta that we have. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so this gives us another uh, property of normal extensions. Now let's change gear, go back to one of your homework assignments. In your homework assignment, you have proved that if I tell you a splitting field E, so now that we know a splitting field is a finite normal extension, I am using this language now. So in your homework assignment, you had that if a splitting field happened to be generated by a single element, if it is F bracket alpha, then the group of automorphisms of E over F, the number of elements of the group of automorphisms of E over F. So in your homework assignment, you viewed this as an F, the set of F embeddings from E to E has precisely number, the number of elements of this is precisely the number of distinct zeros of the minimal polynomial of alpha over F that belong to E. In particular, this number of uh, automorphisms cannot be more than the degree of this field extension. Again, this you could do under this hypothesis that this field extension is of the form F bracket alpha. Such a field extension is called a simple field extension. So again, a field extension is called a simple field extension if it is F bracket alpha for some alpha. Now, it takes us to the following questions. First, what if E is not of the form F bracket alpha? What if E is not a simple field extension? Then what? What can we say about the cardinality of the set of F automorphisms from E to E? Second, when can we be sure that E is a simple field extension? So in the remaining part of today's lecture, we will address the first question. 
What if E is not of the form F bracket alpha? The following theorem gives us a satisfactory, more than satisfactory answer to the first question. And similar to the proof of the, um, of the uniqueness of a splitting field extension, we are going to work with not only F automorphisms, but I'm going to work with two copies of F and try to understand how many extensions I'm going to get when I think about the splitting fields and so on. Okay, let's formulate the problem correctly and uh, try to delve into the statement of the next theorem. Next theorem is one of the most important results that we are going to prove uh, in about the field extensions. So then this next theorem coupled with the previous theorem that we proved about normal extensions, uh, these two theorems hand to hand play extremely important role in understanding field extensions, finite field extensions. Okay, so let's see what is the statement. Suppose I tell you that theta is an F, uh, is a field isomorphism. So F and F prime, both of them are fields and theta is an isomorphism between them. So essentially I'm giving you two copies of the same field F and F prime. I give you a polynomial, small f inside this field, uh, inside the ring of polynomials with coefficients inside this field. And I consider a splitting field of this polynomial over f. I look at the copy of this polynomial inside the target, f prime, and take a splitting field, e prime, of the copy of f in f prime. We have already seen that we can always extend the isomorphism theta to an isomorphism from E to E prime. Okay, so now what we want to understand is how many such possibilities do we have? So we are asking, in how many ways can I extend theta to an isomorphism from E to E prime? We already know that this number is not zero. We can definitely find some way, some theta hat exists. That's an extension of theta. Again, this committing diagram can be useful. So we have this F, we have this F prime, we have this isomorphism theta. And what we are asking is, in how many ways can I make this diagram into a di commuting diagram? In how many ways can I find theta hat that makes this diagram a commutative diagram? And the answer is that it cannot be more than the, in the degree of this field extension. You see the similarity between this and the statement that we have over here. Uh, when F is F prime and theta is just identity, we get that inequality that we have up there, but in your homework assignment, you got it under this assumption. Now we are removing that assumption and we are just working, we are getting the same inequality for every splitting. Now, similar to a statement that we had here, that it was precisely the number of distinct zeros of this minimal polynomial, and we can get the equality if the minimal polynomial does have all the zeros are distinct, we get a similar kind of uh, phenomena in general. And what is it? It says that if I tell you all the irreducible factors of f in f bracket x, so none of them, all of them, do not have multiple zeros. So this means all of them have distinct zeros in E. Then we can get equality. It's a true extension of what you had in your homework assignment, but it is much more subtle to prove this result because here we do not know if a single element is enough to generate uh, the, the entire field. Okay, so let's go through the proof. Uh, the steps of the proof have some similarities with the proof of the uniqueness or the isomorphism extension theorem. Okay, so we are going to proceed by strong induction on the degree of this field extension. That's one of the differences between this and the uh, isomorphism extension theorem. So there we proceeded by induction on the degree of the polynomial, but here we are, we are using the induction 
on the degree of the field extension E over F. If the degree of the field extension is one, then we are done because in that case, E is F and we know E, 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 e prime are isomorphic. So E prime is also F and therefore the set of um, maps from E to E prime whose restriction to F is theta is just theta because E is F, E prime is F prime. Theta hat is supposed to be theta. So we get only one. So we have exactly one element and equality holds and there is nothing to show. We get the inequality. By the way, now I'm focusing on uh, the inequality first. And then when we are done with the proof of inequality, we are going to re-examine the, the proof and see um, how we can improve it under the new assumption that the irreducible factors do not have multiple zeros to, to get the same result uh, for um, equality. Okay, so um, suppose that E is not F. That means what? That means I can find some zero alpha of E, uh, which is not inside F. I mean, I can find some zero of the polynomial F, which is not inside F because other, otherwise E is a splitting field of the polynomial F. If all the zeros of F are already inside capital F, then we get the equality. So we can find some zero that's not inside F. Now for simplification, I mean, for simplification of our notation, uh, let me introduce this notation that uh, theta embeddings from E to E prime means all the functions from E to e, all the ring homomorphisms from E to E prime, such that the restriction of those to F is precisely theta. So this theta in, in the bottom uh, tells me that I'm working with uh, in ring homomorphisms from E to E prime whose restriction to F is theta. Okay. Now, if I tell you theta hat is here, then a theta hat of alpha is going to be a zero of theta hat of F. And that means that uh, theta hat, so in, in, in fact, I can, I can say that it's going to be a zero of theta hat of uh, the minimal polynomial, it is better to say it like this, it is theta hat of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. Theta hat, I mean, alpha is a zero of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. I apply theta hat, and then I get that it's a, um, it is a zero of this minimal polynomial. But because the restriction of theta hat to f is a theta, we get that the theta hat of alpha is a zero of theta of the minimal polynomial of alpha. You see, because the restriction of theta hat to f is theta, we get that a theta hat of alpha is a zero of this. Now, I don't know what theta hat is. You know, that's the whole point. We want to understand how many ways I have, I mean, what are the number of possibilities of this theta hat. But so far, what we understand is that whatever it is, whatever theta hat is, theta hat of alpha should be one of the zeros of theta of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. Okay. That means what? That means if I want, okay, so I want to understand this theta hat and I'm going to do it kind of a step by step. I'm going to add one zero at a time. So to be more precise, I'm going to add one zero and then I'm going to use the strong induction hypothesis to, to deal with the rest of the zeros. So I'm, I'm adding one zero and I'm asking myself, how many possibilities do I have to deal with this particular zero? What are the possible values that I can assign to this zero, to this alpha? So theta of alpha should be a zero of theta of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. But what we have shown earlier is that if I give you a zero, if alpha prime is a zero of this polynomial, then I do indeed have an isomorphism from f bracket alpha 
to F prime bracket alpha, where the restriction of this isomorphism to F is just theta. Okay, Th this we had seen earlier. So altogether, what we are getting is that the, the number of, so I start with this theta, when I restrict it to F bracket alpha, it should send this alpha to a zero of the minimal polynomial of alpha over F. So this means when I restrict it to F bracket alpha, I'm getting an embedding of F bracket alpha to E prime, whose restriction to F is precisely theta. Okay, so I can, I can use this notation of embedding and say, the, say that what we are getting is that the number of embeddings of F bracket alpha to E prime, where when I restrict it to F, I end up getting theta is precisely the number of distinct zeros of theta of M alpha F. Okay, this is what we are getting. Now, if I use this, we get, um, we get this equality. So this number of embeddings is the number of distinct zeros of the theta of the minimal polynomial in E prime. But that one cannot be more than the degree of this polynomial. The degree of this polynomial is the same as the degree of the minimal polynomial of alpha over F, which is exactly the degree of the field extension F bracket alpha over F. So again, let's try to understand. I want to understand how many possibilities theta hat has. Okay, first I say, forget about theta hat and just try to understand how many possibilities do I have to extend theta to F bracket alpha. Not as a map from F bracket alpha to itself, but rather as a map from F bracket alpha to E prime. Because any theta hat that you give me, I can restrict it to F bracket alpha and I get an, an, an embedding from F bracket alpha to E prime, a theta embedding of F bracket alpha to E prime. This part we understood now. This part we understand exactly how many ways we can do. And this inequality tells me that uh, we have at least an upper bound of the degree of the extension of F bracket alpha over F. Now let's go back to the main question. So we wanted to understand in how many ways we can get an extension of theta. So essentially I'm in this kind of picture. I have this theta and I want to see how many ways I can extend it from E to E prime. But then I started with this intermediate field and I asked myself, how many ways can I extend theta to a, an embedding of F bracket alpha? Now let's fix one of those embeddings. Let's fix it and call it theta one. For one of these embeddings, I ask myself, how many ways, I fix this theta hat, how many ways can I, can I extend this theta hat, this theta one to a theta hat? Okay, so again, I'm fixing, I am fixing this theta one, and I'm asking myself, how many ways can I extend this theta one? So I, I think I wrote it over here. I'm fixing this uh, theta one, so for a given theta one, I'm asking myself, how many ways can I find, can I extend it uh, to an isomorphism theta hat from E to E prime? Now, again, notice what, I, what do I want to do at this point? I want to use the induction hypothesis. In order to use the induction hypothesis, I need to view E as a splitting field of some polynomial over F bracket alpha. And argue that E prime is a splitting field of some polynomial of theta one of the same polynomial over this guy. As soon as I do that, then I can use the induction hypothesis. Okay, so let's, let's see why, why we can do that. E is a splitting field of F over F, capital F. But I mean, when it's a splitting of a uh, smaller field, it, it is definitely a splitting field over, if I enlarge the base field, I will be still a splitting field of the same polynomial 
over this larger base field. So E is a splitting field of the same polynomial in over F bracket alpha. Similarly, E prime is a splitting field is a splitting field of theta of f, which is theta one of f over the image. Because I mean, it is a splitting field over f, uh, over f prime, I should have said here, it's, this is f prime. And therefore it is also a splitting field over f prime joined with this uh, extra zero, this extra. And notice that the degree of this field extension is genuinely smaller than degree of E over F, so I, I am allowed to use the strong induction hypothesis. By the strong induction hypothesis, we know that the possible theta one embeddings from E to E prime, this number is at most this field extension, degree of this field extension. Now I can answer the question that we were asking, I mean, we, we, we were interested in. We wanted to understand how many theta embeddings we had from E to E prime. I add one alpha to it. I get some embedding theta one from F bracket alpha to E prime. So what am I saying? I'm saying whatever you give me when I restrict it to F bracket alpha, it should be one of these theta ones. And when I give you two different theta ones, I cannot get the same extension. So therefore, first I add alpha. I ask myself, what are the possibilities that I can get by enlarging this theta one? So I, I assume that my restriction to F bracket alpha is theta one. I ask myself how many ways now I can extend theta one and I add them. So altogether I get the possible theta embeddings from E to E prime. Now this term inside, By the induction hypothesis, this inequality over here, this inequality tells me that each one of these terms is going to be at most this. This means how many terms I have of this, uh, at most this quantity? I have this many of these terms because this is the set that we have over here. I have this many terms that are at most degree of uh, E over F bracket alpha. Now, the number of theta embeddings of F bracket alpha to E, as we have seen over here, is at most the degree of the field extension F bracket alpha over F. And therefore, we have that this term over here is at most the degree of this field extension F bracket alpha over F. So altogether, we get that this product holds. Now let's move to the moreover part of the result. To prove the moreover part, um, we go back through this argument and ask ourselves, do I have equality or not? Okay, so let's start with the first part. In the first part, we knew that the number of embeddings, so if you remember, we had this, then, oops, we had that the cardinality of theta embeddings of F bracket alpha to E prime is equal to the number of distinct zeros of theta of the minimal polynomial of alpha over F. So this is going to help us to understand um, how many uh, theta embeddings F bracket alpha has inside E prime. That was one of the key blocks in the previous inequality, in the proof of the previous inequality. 
So let's uh, let's go through the hypothesis. Let's see what what are what the hypothesis tells us. Because alpha is a zero of f, the minimal polynomial of alpha over f is an irreducible factor of f. Now I, our hypothesis tells us that this irreducible factor has distinct zeros in E. If you remember, we have proved this result that uh, a polynomial has distinct zeros in its splitting field precisely when it is co-prime with its derivative. So this means the GCD of this minimal polynomial and its derivative is one, is a unit. Now I apply theta. Theta is an isomorphism between the fields f and f bracket and f prime, and therefore it's an isomorphism between f bracket x and f prime bracket x. So the GCD of theta of the minimal polynomial and its derivative is again one, which means theta of the minimal polynomial has distinct zeros in E prime. Now I can use this blue result and deduce that the number of theta embeddings of f bracket alpha into E prime, which is the degree, I mean, now that I know all the zeros are distinct, I can use that and I get that the equality is equal to the degree of this minimal theta of the minimal polynomial, which is the equal to the degree of the minimal polynomial. And that is equal to the degree of this field extension. So, one of the main ingredients of the previous inequality, now it turns out to be an equality using the hypothesis that we have. Now, if you remember again, going back to this proof, uh, the second step of this inequality comes from this star. And this star is based on the fact that E is a splitting field of this polynomial F, not only over, I mean, also over F, F bracket alpha, we know that it is a splitting field over F, and then we added alpha and we said, okay, it is also a splitting field over this larger base field. Now, I want to use induction hypothesis and get the equality. That means what? That means I have to argue why all the irreducible factors of F, not only inside F bracket X, but also inside F bracket alpha bracket X, so now irreducibility and irreducible factors are different. I might have a smaller uh, irreducible factors in F bracket alpha, in the ring of polynomials with coefficients in F bracket alpha. But I need to argue that all of these irreducible factors that, are, that might be different from the ones that we have from the hypothesis, they still have distinct zeros in, in the splitting field E. As soon as I show that, then I can use the strong induction hypothesis. I get the equality and I can repeat uh, these uh, inequalities that we have over here and replace the inequalities with equalities and get the result. Okay, so I pick an irreducible factor, P. So P is an irreducible factor of F in F bracket alpha bracket X. And I need to show, show that it has distinct zeros in E. So let's, let's pick a beta, a zero of this polynomial. Then, uh, because P is irreducible, it is its leading coefficient times the minimal polynomial of this beta. OK. Now, uh, by a result that we also argued earlier, that implies that it divides the minimal polynomial of beta over the larger, uh, over the smaller field, capital F. But the minimal polynomial of beta over F, notice that beta is a zero of F, and therefore the minimal polynomial of beta over F is an irreducible factor of F in F bracket X. By the hypothesis, all the irreducible factors of F in E have distinct zeros. So this does not have multiple zeros in E. And P divides this polynomial. Therefore, 
P cannot have multiple zeros in E. And that's exactly what we wanted to show then. And now we are proving that every irreducible factor of F inside this larger, in larger ring still do not have any multiple zeros in E. And therefore I can, I am allowed to use the strong induction uh, hypothesis for the equality part. And from there I can deduce that for every theta one in the theta embeddings of F brackets alpha, when I look at theta one embeddings from E to E prime, I get that this cardinality is precisely the degree of the field extension of E over F bracket alpha. It, by similar argument as the inequality case. I am viewing E and E prime as a splitting field over F bracket alpha. Then I am taking this theta one as an, as an isomorphism from F bracket alpha to F prime bracket theta one of alpha and we get this equality. Now we can repeat uh, similar uh, terms uh, as the case of inequality and view theta automorphisms from E to E prime by adding one alpha, I mean by adding alpha and asking myself, what is this restriction? Fixing that restriction, asking how many ways can I extend this restriction and answering it, saying that this, the way that I extend this restriction using the induction hypothesis is precisely the degree of the field extension E over F bracket alpha. And how many terms do I have? I have precisely this many terms. That means how many ways can I, ex can I embed F bracket alpha into E prime when I, I mean, theta embeddings of F bracket alpha to E prime. And the answer was that it is precisely the degree of the field extension F bracket alpha over F. Altogether, using the tower rule, we get the equal. Okay, so sorry that I went over time, but the next lecture will be a bit shorter. And uh, I didn't want to split this long proof into shorter steps because then it would have been harder for you to follow. And the steps, I want to have all of them in the same uh, video, um, but uh, you should pause several times and go through the argument uh, slowly try to digest each step. And the main ideas at the end is that we are adding one zero at a time, but because we want to repeat this process of adding zeros one at a time, whenever you see this process one again, again, and again, that means we are using induction. So that's what we are doing. We add one zero, ask ourselves, how many ways can I extend my embedding? to this zero and where, where does this zero, where can this zero be sent? And then we use strong induction hypothesis to finish it.